Good evening, everyone. This is Juan Soto. I'm the chapter president of Access with SQL Server. We got a great, great uh, chat here tonight. Um, we're going to start the meeting with a few announcements that are very important. And then we're going to go straight with our very special guest coming live from us from Europe, Philip Stifel. And uh, we will uh, get to him in a minute. But first, I want to bring you a couple of urgent uh, updates. One of them is that Windows 10 updates are causing the blue screen of death. So I put in a paste in the chat there uh, where WebEx, a link to Tom's guide that explains this. I, my suggestion, and as well as those uh, in that guide, is to turn off Windows Update and make sure that uh, it doesn't become, uh, Windows 10 doesn't become unstable. So let's look out for that. I'm now going to share my screen for my next update. And let me do that now. I'll be sharing my screen as well as Philippe Lind, our presenter here. But uh, I'll start by sharing mine. And actually, what I'd like to do is I have a, <laughs> I upgraded to a huge uh, ultra wide monitor. So let me stop sharing and only share my browser here. So give me a second while I do that. Welcome, everyone. We just started. This is Juan Soto, the chapter president for uh, Access User Groups. All right. So my next update tonight is, um, let me know if you can see my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Starting. All right. I think so, I may have shared oh, it's the, there. I'm, I'm, it. Now. All right. Do you see the uh, T-SQL converter? Yeah. So you seen it? All right. Thank you so much. All right. So I wanted to show you, we've been, the team behind this, Ben Sackrich and uh, Hayden Ingram, have been putting a lot of work into this access to T SQL converter. Have you ever heard of it? I'm going to give you the link here in the chat window. And one of the latest improvements they've had is the ability to issue warnings. So as you can see here, we got some warnings here about that. So there's a wide range of warnings there that tell you about uh, why you may be having problems with the conversion. For example, a custom a custom function or a temp bar in this case. So there's the link to that in the chat. So if, you, if you're not seeing the links, go ahead and open the chat window. You can do that. And this is the Windows 10 update disaster I mentioned earlier, app crashing. And you know when you count on your computer like I do, I really can't afford. So I went ahead and I stopped uh, automatic updates on Windows 10. I'm going to share this post here uh, in the chat window. So instructions on how to uh, turn off automatic updates. All right, and then the last announcement is uh, I am going to be hosting uh, Axe Latin America tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. where we're going to be doing a lab with SQL Server Migration Assistant in Spanish. So if you want to hear our SQL Server Academy in Spanish, you're welcome to join us tomorrow at 6.30. So back-to-back -back evenings for me. All right, so i like to get started with our special guest, Philip Seifel. Uh, 20 years ago, Philip was hired for his first project as a Microsoft Access and SQL Server developer and trainer to spot not having any experience with SQL Server. Well, we really dare to talk about that next time in Europe, uh, Philip, uh, at the bar, how uh, you got that job gig. And then since then, he accumulated yeah. quite a bit of experience with SQL Server, which you're going to see here tonight, particularly in combination with Access. He loves to share his knowledge about Access, VBA, and SQL on his website. Uh, codebiconic.com, and I might be murdering the uh, pronunciation, but I'd like to show that website before we get started here. So let me go ahead and paste the website and the link there so you guys can see it as well as in the chat window. And his website has got some really great information, so I encourage everyone on the call to bookmark it. And um, tell me, uh, Philip, uh, uh, well, let's just get finished the instruction. And he also has a YouTube channel. With lots of videos, I'm really envious because he does a great job for production. This is the video in question that I'm going to be talking with you guys about with Philip, his research on access with SQL Server. Welcome, Philip. Philip or Philip? How would you like to pronounce it? It's Philip. Philip, yeah. welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that introduction, Juan. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, it's, uh, super exciting to have you. I've been a huge admirer of your, of your YouTube videos. I, you know, I started with the podcast. I haven't done an episode in a year of the Access Podcast, so I have a really keen sense of how 
difficult it can be to send these videos out on a regular basis. Yeah, it's, it's really a struggle. I didn't do many videos last year. I think uh, like four or five in total and most of them were in December. So that was basically a year of um, just one new video over the whole year. It sometimes is really difficult to fit that into the, the daily work schedule and stuff. So I fully understand you if you have struggling with your podcasts. Well, thank you so much for the sympathy. Uh, you know, uh, it's one o'clock in the morning in Europe where you're at. What country are you from? I'm from Germany, actually. Oh, I'm near course. Frankfurt okay. Airport. That that might be known to some of you because if you fly into Europe, there's a good chance you you land in Frankfurt. If you don't go to the UK to Heathrow, then most likely if you have a uh, um, stop over in in Europe, you will basically fly over my house. Oh, nice, nice. Well, look, um, we appreciate you staying up tonight and uh, talking with us. Oh, I want to quit ask you, I'm here on your website, what is this, how do you pronounce this word? What does it mean? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's basically code cabinet. That, that K in the middle was a little bit of the, the Dinglish, uh, um, like in Germany, we kind of mix English and German words. And that was a little bit making fun of that. And I did that 20 years ago. I probably wouldn't do it that way uh, today, but... Uh, back then, it was, was just the, the British code, which we all use, or the American word code, with the German word cabinet, which basically is the same as in English. So it's a cabinet full of code. That basically was the idea behind it, but cabinet written in the German uh, spelling. Very real, very good. Well, look, uh, thanks for explaining that for us. And uh, it looks like you um, you put a lot of uh, uh, effort in YouTube. Uh, but what do you do for a living? Are you a consultant? Do you have your own consulting practice or you work for somebody? Yeah, I'm an independent consultant and I work with a couple of freelancers that do work for me and occasionally I do work for them. So it's a bit of a partnership. But in, in recent years, they usually work for me because um, due to my website and the YouTube channel and doing conference talks and stuff, I, I get a couple of clients who are interested in me doing work for them. And so I've got usually more work than I can handle alone. Unfortunately, due to the, the COVID crisis at the moment, that um, has taken a bit of a hit, but I, I hope that will recover within the next couple of months. Well, that's great to hear that the YouTube channel has helped you out. You know, I... Um... I use a lot of Google advertising in my practice to the clients, and I spend quite a lot of money every month, and it really does uh, bring in the, the revenue. But uh, I probably should explore uh, using YouTube more in terms of uh, getting more exposure for my brand. But, you know, a lot of our efforts in YouTube is with Access User Groups, and we don't uh, – I try to keep that separate from my business, IT Impact, from the, uh, from the uh, Access User Group uh, videos. And so it has its own login and its own YouTube channel separate from my company. But it's good to know that you're getting business from your YouTube stuff. Now, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, and I'm going to bring up a uh, article that you uh, happen to mention. And, you know, I don't know who, but somebody, somebody, maybe it was Luke, who, Luke Chung from FMS, who brought it to, to my attention. But you wrote this really interesting article on how, when you use link tables and access, and I'm going to paste this link, guys, in the chat so you can follow along, uh, you really some really interesting things. <laughs> now, I've been working with access with SQL Server for the last probably 12 years now, and uh, I didn't even know about this. So I did some really interesting research that you did in terms of optimization and what you're seeing in the background. And pretty much the gist of what you were talking in this article is, and then, We'll, be, we'll get to your video on this article in a second, is the fact that uh, behind the scenes there's some, there's some things that I would have never guessed are happening between Access and SQL Server. And so I'd like to talk to you about that tonight. One of the things I wanted to ask you is, how did you come across this topic about using the SQL profiler to find out what Access is doing with SQL Server in the background? 
Well, um, this text was actually one of the, the very first long form texts I wrote for my website and that was like 19 years ago or so. It was originally only available in German and I just recently translated it to English. And the original uh, text there, I, I used ODBC tracing to kind of analyze that stuff. But that is, it's possible, but it's a huge pain. But so my, my basic knowledge of that goes back like 19 to 20 years. But in, in the meantime, I rather turned to SQL Server Profiler, which is nowadays a bit of obsolete because there are extended events. And for most purposes, extended events are actually the recommended way to do such sort of profiling. But if you just want to do an ad hoc um, like profiling session on, on per particular on your development server, um, then I think Profiler is the best tool available for, for user friendliness and for ease of use where you just fire up the program. And I can do a demo in a second. Um, well, you just because, well, you know, one of the things that I want mean, the gist of the article, though, the really stroke of genius that you had was you discovered that if you send a query to a SQL Server, it's not that query that's coming back, but rather Access is dividing the query in multiple queries. Like, for example, this image I have here, you have a three table join uh, that's going as three different queries to SQL Server. Now, what's happening there is uh, you're you're actually getting three data sets back from SQL Server to Access, and then Access is doing the processing, right? Yes, actually, that that is correct. And the problem with that is, and and the the reason why I kind of did the research in the first place is that if you link SQL Server tables to Access with ODBC, um, if you just query one table, it's going pretty fast and if you create a query with two tables and three tables you usually have pretty good results performance wise but sometimes you just add another table and it might be a, a pretty small table so it's not really adding a huge number of uh, additional records to it but you just add one table to the query and suddenly um, all things just go south and, and performance drops, not like uh, it took two seconds before and it's taking three or four seconds now, but it's like it's the executing the query took like two seconds before and it's 10 minutes now. So, so there is the, certainly yes. it was obvious there's something going very, very wrong. Uh, sometimes and and that was well, you know, basically when I, when, when I do these seminars and how to optimize access to SQL Server I always preface it saying I'm not really a SQL Server expert I'm an expert in optimizing access to SQL Server and so one of the things I'm showing this uh, part of your video here and I, for those of you I already put the link in the chat but this this particular query is in the Northwind database. It's composed of one, two, three, six tables with left joins. And this table, this query will actually time out. Uh, and it's I can't tell you how critical this performance is because of the fact that nowadays, when you originally wrote the article, Azure was in existence, right? There was no Azure, there was no cloud in the ser server in the cloud. Now there is, and so these kind of problems tend to magnify. I have a, uh, an employee of mine, Mark Edwards, on the call, and Mark can uh, really testify to the fact that we deal with these kind of projects day in and day out, and people, companies come to us and say, hey, we need to take this database to the cloud because we have, especially in the era of COVID, that our employees are working from home, and it's not really usable the way it is. And, uh, you know, what we've been doing in the, until now is when we see a query like this, we don't even bother running it. We just convert it into a view because we just know from uh, from our, our experience that when you have these kind of uh, many left joins, it's just going to be terrible, crappy, terrible with the uh, link tables and ODBC. Now, you know, one of the things that was I've always heard, and maybe you can correct me on this, is that, oh, the ODBC drivers, they're great. They'll do the translation for you and 
they'll they'll take their access query and they're so smart and they'll send it to SQL Server and you can sit back and relax and they'll be just great. Now we use ODBC 17, which is the latest version. For all you kids out there, make sure you use that when you do these kind of projects. But before that was client 11. Now we use ODBC 17. And you know, so when I when I saw this research, I was taken aback. I'm like, what happened? What happened to all this talk I heard about the driver being smart enough to know better? Yeah, well, it's not really the driver that's the problem here. It is the access database engine. Um, I, in my experience, performance-wise, there's not too much difference between uh, different versions of the driver. I actually, for um, projects with SQL Server on-prem, I sometimes still use the original SQL Server driver that came with SQL Server 2000 that has oh, been no. updated a little <laughs> bit. Okay, yeah, well, you know, I, I, and I know probably why you do it because you don't want to go to the house of installing the driver, right? And everybody does that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you are if you're doing it for an on-prem server, the differences are not that big. The the new ODBC uh, 17 driver it is slightly faster, but it's really hard to notice a difference. Um, but of course, well, when you're you're, I think you're right. I mean, when you're on-prem, you don't notice the difference. But when you compare cloud i think that's when it magnifies a little bit and that's why our policy is always to use the latest driver uh and yeah. ben sackridge has a question for us so he says what are the difference between the various odbc drivers and can send that actually someone actually does make the differences well, i don't know if we can do that ben thanks for your question but uh the fact is that uh, the best practice at least from my standpoint is use the latest odbc driver because it supports the latest azure features the latest security methods uh, is supposed to give you the best performance. Now you're saying that the driver is not the issue, right? But rather, yeah. it's access is the issue, right? Yes, absolutely. Just uh, to confirm what you just said, the the main point of the of using the new drivers for Azure is that you can use the enhanced security mechanisms like encryption and um azure authentication and that makes it really mandatory to use the new drivers if you are connecting to Azure. But um, regarding these performance topics, I, I actually didn't do much research if the driver makes much of a difference. But the, the basic problem is also there with the newest ODBC 17 drivers. It might have some queries that that one uh, translates better, but the, the core problem is the access database engine. It, it um, sometimes just splits up the query and the driver can't do anything about it because Access and uh, the ACE engine already do that. And I'm not absolutely sure why they do that. Maybe it's because they, they cannot really figure out um, if the ODBC driver can handle this type of query the way Access wants to execute it. And, and that is, you all know the slightly funny access join syntax with all those brackets and those nested joins. I absolutely hate them because I can hardly read them, let alone write them. And I guess that is part of the problem that, that there is some sort of threshold where access thinks, oh, I messed up this query so badly, my, my own engine will understand it, but I don't think any ODBC connected engine will understand it. Uh, so I rather break it up into multiple simpler paths. And that is where it all falls apart performance wise. But That's you a good explanation. That's a very, yeah. very good explanation about the underlying problem. So, um, so you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we always do is we want to, uh, when we do a project converting access back into a SQL Server back end, is we, we make a, a purpose of running all the queries and see how slow they are. And so uh, if we notice any performance hits on these queries, right away, turn them to views. Now, the SQL Server Migration Assistant has the capability to convert any and all queries uh, to, for the most part, to SQL Server views, as long as you're using temp bars or custom functions or syntax that's not uh, incompatible with uh, SQL Server. But we tend to uh, leave them with linked tables 
just because we rather not to convert everything to a view if we can avoid it. Now, one of the things that you mentioned at the beginning of the blog post and the video is when you have ODBC tables linked and access, is there another way to link a table from SQL Server other than ODBC? I'm not aware of that. Well, um, really, linking a table is only possible with ODBC. But I also do a lot of ADP conversion work, the, the old access data projects that directly connected to SQL Server instead of a local access database. And they, they were a great way to work with SQL Server, but unfortunately Microsoft discontinued them with Access 2013. Yeah. And so to, to bring them forward, you need to convert them to um, basically an ACCDB file format database but you can still use lots of those OLADB and ADO um, technology to st connect to SQL Server. You can even use that to bind um, SQL Server data to access forms. So that would be an alternative but it's not as straightforward because you need to do any uh, work in VBA code regarding the data yes. binding. You, you don't need to actually code the update logic. That is still done by the built-in data binding of access, but the connection, the, the binding of the record set to the form, all that has to be done in, in VBA, and you can't just drag fields into your form and, and stuff like that. That's all not possible. But nevertheless, the performance is very, very good because then always uh, the, the queries are sent to the server and executed there. So it, it avoids the breakup, this, which is what you demonstrate in your uh, blog post here in this graphic, how Access takes a single query and breaks it up into different queries uh, for execution. Now, one of the things that um, I wanted to uh, let you know in terms of ADODB, we love ADODB. I mean, I, I created the methodology Easy ADODB in order to uh, make it easy to code and access, and you can search for that in my blog, Easy ADODB. But, uh, you know, I tend to shy away from, uh, from uh, doing a data bind with a form with an ADLDB record set where you create the ODB record set, you bind to the form, and then you disconnect from the server. And supposedly that gives you some great performance, but we found ran into some issues, so we shy away from that. And instead we use link tables with either views, queries, or, or link tables, right, to bind our forms. We have another question from Ben Sackridge. He says here, a newer ODBC driver claims to have better recovery after a drive connection. I don't think that's uh was the ODBC driver. I think what it is is that access itself got better and more forgiving with uh, connections to SQL Server. Is that your understanding as well, Philippe? Yeah, I think so. The, the main problem is actually access, or has been access in the past, that it, that it just doesn't really or didn't really try to reconnect um, to SQL Server. And that is something Microsoft improved in, I don't know exactly in which release, I think it was about two years ago, that they uh, improved the, the ability of access to reconnect if there was a connection drop. Because yeah. previously you haven't had a chance. If the connection dropped at one point in time, access would refuse to reconnect. You had to shut down access and restart. Yes. And now that was a source of frustration that uh, yes, we don't have that anymore. Absolutely. That's great. That's great. All right. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. So I'm going to stop sharing. And again, uh, you know, I want to thank you because I reached out to you late, and you still decided to come on board and, and do this for me. So I appreciate it. We have 16 people on the call. Thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. So now, Philippe is going to share his screen with us and he's going to show us a couple of the neat things that he's um, been working on. So what is going on here? That's not okay, what I can I'm see on. your screen now. Yeah, great, great. So um, what I've got here is the Northwind database with um, just upsize to SQL Server with, I think I used the um, migration assistant 
to do that. And I linked all the tables um, to the database with ODBC, but I didn't do much work. And it's not really that I, I want to use that for production. It's just a, a demo database, basically. And if we just click on any table, then it responds pretty quick. We see data and there are some tables where there are actually quite a few rows in there. So this is the orders table. And if I just clicked at the go to last record button and you see there are 1.2 million records in there. So there is a bit of data. And the, the backend server is on the local network, but it's not on my machine here. So, but okay. the, that is probably uh, well known for you all. The, the in interesting part I would like to talk about is SQL Server Profiler. And if you um, installed the, the SQL Server client components, then you also have SQL Server Profiler. But um, I, I see it frequently, people don't really know what to do with it. So that's what I want to show you today. So I start up SQL Server Profiler and it usually starts up with a blank gray screen, but you can go uh, in the upper left corner and there is the, the button here for new trace and I click that and this is a familiar uh, connection dialog for SQL Server. And I usually absolutely discourage people from working with a um, system administrator account on SQL Server. But unfortunately, for working with Profiler, you need a uh, very high level privilege account to do that. So um, I do what I usually tell people not to do. I log in using the SA account here. Unfortunately, that has to be that way. And you... Uh, now, with I the new version won't... that you mentioned, in the, excuse me, with the new version you mentioned, which is uh, not profile, but the other technology, do you still need those higher privileges? Um, extended events. No, not necessarily. Um, the thing is, if you use Profiler and connect to SQL Server, then you basically just by, by um, means of that connection, you have the ability to basically see everything that's going on um, in in um, like any Traffic statement wise. and and yeah, yeah. whatever's happening um, on SQL Server, whatever statement is sent to SQL Server, you are able to see that. And with extended events, this can be narrowed down quite a bit. So you don't need that excessive um, permissions to do that. And I, I'm not an expert in extended events, but I think if you are the database owner of a database, then you would be able to use extended events for that database. But don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure that this is true. But you definitely need uh, much lower permissions for that. Got it. Okay. So, um, I just, um, usually if you connect to SQL Server, it will open up this window and I will just hit the run uh, button and you will see there are a couple of processes running here. And this is, it is a production server, but only for our development team. And because we are in the middle of the night, there is no one working except me at the moment. But if you do that um, during daytime, yeah, you see, there, there's the job manager. And I'm not doing anything. And you see the trace is running and it's pushing out um, statements here. And this is going to be a hot mess if you do that on a server that's used by a couple of people. So the most important bit to learn is basically to to filter down to the things you want to see. And I just run another query here in Access. And now you see, I pause the, the execution. And now you see these are Access queries. But um, it is going to be, you see, here's another, um, another now, connection. Is each one of those lines a connection? Well, not, um, necessarily. No, not necessarily. Um, 
each line is a SQL statement. You um, let's go over here a bit. You see the client process ID. So all yeah. these are statements from one connection, and this one here is another, and here is yet another connection. So just on this screen, there are three connections active. Well, now, Access is notorious for opening many connections to SQL Server. So when you have a single Access database doing that, and you multiply that times 20 users, for example, you end up with hundreds of connections, correct? Yes, indeed. You might have quite a few connections. Um, Access will use one main connection and open up additional ones, like two or three is pretty frequent. But if you are using lots of uh, domain aggregate functions, like the dsum, uh, dcount and stuff, and you've got those in, in a subform and, and do that for each record, you might actually see up to 10 different connections for oh, one that's single access that's client. Terrible. And you know, and that's one of the real nice things about ADP, which is absolute technology no longer available. It limited everything to just one connection. No, it didn't. It didn't. Oh, no, but, I thought it did. Um, no, 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 no. It also opens additional connections if required. However, it would open much fewer connections. You will use uh, two, maybe three connections with an ADP, but to go beyond that, that would be fairly exotic. It might happen if you have a subform um, on, your, on your form, uh, or rather multiple subforms on a main form, it will also open up multiple connections. But yeah. um, it's nothing compared to um, ODBC. So one of the things that frustrates the uh, IT departments worldwide is as an access developer, you know, I tell them I'm a SQL Server or the back end, they, the eyes start rolling back in their heads because they get so upset with all these connections to their server. And so I tell them, I, I had them off, I says, look, that, you know, I can't control what connections the access itself will have, but in the code, we only use one connection. So if you use my easy, easy ADODB methodology, it routes all your calls to SQL Server through one connection. So at least that, and the code-wise, the developer has some control over it. Yes, that, that is actually very helpful to at least do a tiny bit of uh, control and don't leave anything, everything to access to, to mess up. But um, I think we, we should go on here because if you want to use um, Profiler, there is one thing you should actually uh, do first. You see here, this one is our access user. It's the Northwind user. And I don't want to see all those services and other users that are also working on here. So I go to the properties button here and to the event selection. And you can actually um, define which events should be traced. But I think for 99% of uh, cases, it's just fine the way it is. But you need to go to, to the lower right corner and do some uh, column filters here. And the most helpful usually is the login name. And you can just do a filter for north wind percent. So it's just using SQL uh, um, placeholders. And you can add this filter. And I, I just rerun my query, and now you see all those other connections are gone, and I only see the Northwind user in here. And now if I open up another query uh, and yet another, and then you see there are a couple of connections here, but it's not that overwhelming anymore that you really can't find anything. Okay. So, um, now let's close these. Now, what and driver are you using for this, by the way? Is it 17 or? <laughs> I don't know. I need to look. But it might be actually the... Um, the well, if you hover over the table link, it might tell you. Trusted connection. Oh, you're using a DSN. 
We yeah, I'm using it. Yes, yeah. and and I'm not sure which driver it is. Uh, that could be a topic, like Ben suggested. We may do a topic comparing uh, uh, the pro performance of the native SQL Server driver, which honestly I recommend nobody use. The one that ships with Windows, that thing is so old, it's not even funny. It's not compatible with Azure. So please uh, stay away from that. Um, um, yeah. The, use the latest drivers if you can. Yeah, that, that is pretty old. Um, I usually, uh, it's a trade-off if you are on-prem, if you just want to distribute a quick database. Um, it's not too bad to use the old driver because you don't really need to bother with distributing the driver and telling the IT department, make sure everybody has the driver I want to use and stuff. But um, if that is a mission critical application, then definitely the effort is justified to, to use the newer driver. And the, the reason why I use the old driver here is exactly that distribution problem because I open this database, it's on my um, OneDrive and just the front end database. And I open that on this computer, on, on my main desktop computer and on a couple of virtual machines. And I want to use it everywhere for different demos and purposes. And this driver is available everywhere. And that's the reason why I use it in that demo. Okay. So, but the the newer drivers don't make much of a difference. I, regarding the core problems I want to, to uh, show here, in other regards, they make a huge difference. So don't get me wrong on that. Okay. So let's look at a query. And I, I actually can't really remember which one I used. So let's try this one first and I clear all the trace data in here, and now I run the order summary query, and switch over. invoice data, just so you know, the one that would time out is invoice data. Invoice data, okay. Yeah, that one's I timed out. Yeah, but um, this one is looking funny already. Not really sure Still what it is. Still gradient access. Yeah, I'm not really sure what it's doing here because this doesn't look too bad. Because now, uh, while we're waiting, let, let's look at what we see here. You've got um, basically all the commands that are executed here. And if you select one, you'll see the full SQL statement here. And that is roughly familiar. You see... Um, uh, and you see uh, the the stuff going on here. Maybe I switch off auto scroll, so then it doesn't uh, uh, scroll. You you see the from clause here, and it's actually it contains a little bit of ODBC translation. That OJ um, means it's an auto join. That is a hint for the ODBC driver and then it's mixed up with the left join but this query is pretty okay because all the the basically all the tables and all the, the query were sent in one go but you see one thing already here's another query coming up and that is caused by a function used in that query and that is causing different um a different query that is basically linked to that and that is executed as well. So this query is already split up, but that is not the, the problem um, that we were talking earlier with the multiple joins, but there's a function in, I don't know, I think it's an aggregate somewhere. Um, but while we look at that, I would like to show a couple of things that are very interesting already in, in Profiler because you, you have some information here how expensive a query is. So if you just, you know, you don't have any access to the query or not looking at it right now, you just see um, these read counts and I actually should... Uh, requesting an editor. I'm not sure what to do here. Um, 
So these are very important uh, bits, the CPU load, the, the read operations on disk and the duration of the query. These are already indicators that are telling you how expensive is this query. And these are pretty big numbers that are basically CPU bugs and query bugs. I'm not, I'm not really uh, sure what they mean in terms of um, in, in terms of value kind of um, resources that they are used. But this is an expensive query and these are milliseconds. So you see the query took 51,000 milliseconds. So that is a lot actually. Well, that's good so, to know. So going back to um, our query, now we've got the results here, but it took quite a while. Yeah, Ben, thank you. I, I'm getting to that in a minute. Or, or rather, before I forget it, um, I, I should address it right away. Um, one of the reasons why it is rather um, discouraged to use Profiler nowadays and rather use extended events is that it is causing quite a bit of a performance drop on the server because it's using lots of resources and it's basically tracing uh lots of stuff and sql server has to do a lot of work to provide this information for all the queries that are coming in so you shouldn't let sql profiler run long term at least not on a production server if it's your local development server um who cares it's only you that that is suffering by bad performance but if you're connecting to a production server then just do it really quick to look at some stuff you want to see and then close it down again. That is Got pretty it. important. So um, now let's turn to, to the other query. It was uh, the invoice data query. And yeah, let's, show it in design view. Yeah, go. show it in the design view. And it is a little bit more complicated. It's basically six different tables joined here with outer joins. Um, but that alone wouldn't cause an access backend to suffer that bad performance. It might be slower than a simpler query, of course, but it will not um, totally break down. So these five queries are these five tables and the query and I just clean up uh, this and now I I run um, the query in here and you will see probably um, hang on so you see there is one query here and it's not containing six tables but only the orders table the shippers table and these are just two and if we continue to to um kind of uh investigate here then we should see that there are additional queries executed oh my goodness yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is going to be a huge mess. But um, where are we? That, you you need a, some time to kind of um, find out the the right stuff. Now here's another query. This is querying the employee table that was also involved there. Mm -hmm. And now here it's going to order details to fetch detail rows and their customers here and that that That's basically terrible, you see terrible, terrible, terrible. you see the query has been split up into a lot of different queries yeah and so now let me ask you this if you ran this same query with a pass to query that doesn't happen correct no 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 then then everything is fine if you run the okay. path through query um the sql will pass on to sql server and it's only the responsibility of SQL Server to execute the SQL and return the results. There's no messing around with that. And that is just another indicator that it's not the ODBC driver messing things up, but access. If you just okay. tell access, don't mess with the query, send it straight through as a pass-through query, 
then everything Absolutely. is fine usually. But um, for, yeah, for people who might not questions. know it, the pass through queries are read only. That that is a huge yeah. drawback with them. Unfortunately. It is. It is. Which in ADP was wasn't an issue because there was no pass through queries in ADP. You can just bind it straight to the form. All right. So we have a couple questions here. Um, you know, Alphonse makes an interesting uh, statement in that uh, it gets interesting trace when you try to do an insert in a table or an empty column. Now, you know, to be fair, uh, I always stay away from inserting a large amount of data into SQL Server with access because I call those coffee break queries. You just start the query. If you're doing, the, for example, 100,000 rows of insert, I mean, that'll take forever. I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous how slow it is. And so we just uh, we use other methods. We'll use uh, ADODB with HTML insert into the procedure, and then you got to code the insert procedure. And lately, what we've been doing is a lot of SSIS packages, and we just let SQL Server import the data as opposed to that and get access out of completely out of the question. But do you have any um, do you have any um, insights as to why it takes so agonizingly slow to insert a lot of data into SQL Server from access? Actually, I can't really say much about that because um, I, I haven't had the situation where I had to upload huge amounts of data into SQL Server using Access. It's usually um, inserting a couple of hundred rows with a file import or so. That That is basically the maximum I've done in my projects. I never encountered the situation where I had to kind of upload okay. thousands. I was just rows. curious. I was just curious. Yeah. Unfortunately, apparently... I cannot shed any light on that. Yeah. So Alphonse says, uh, try a single row insert. We might try that if we have time, Alphonse. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see here. Um, if you want to, uh, don't forget to worry. All right, so uh, Bet is asking us, have you done testing speed if access queries are written in SQL style, i.e. without joins and also property aliasing tables? Well, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the aliasing does help a little bit. Yeah, the SQL style does help a little bit, but you still have an underlying problem where access is still going to divide into separate queries, right, uh, Philip? Yeah, um, that doesn't really help because you you are basically forced by access to use the access join syntax. If you would use the for much simpler syntax, at least for me, with um, the the joins just one after the other, um, access does it for two or three tables max, and then it will complain and tell you that, that it doesn't understand it, and you need to uh, switch back to that nested bracketed uh, um, parenthesis SQL syntax, and, and that's basically no way around it unless you use pass-through queries, but they, these are a totally different breed altogether. Yeah, I mean, we can have Ben Zacharis talk about how difficult it was been for him to com to get the tool to work that uh, demonstrated at the beginning of the hour. Uh, convert access query to T SQL syntax has been quite challenging. It's still an ongoing process. Uh, I've yeah, I, I would. Go ahead. I would really love to to hear about um, how that was implemented because I guess you would basically need to write a SQL parser to do that and. That would be a fascinating topic, I think. Yeah, I think so too. We might bring Ben back to talk more about that. He uses uh, regex expressions a lot in that. Uh, so you can, if you want to learn more about it, it's uh, regex. I believe regex.com. But uh, regex is what is the uh, URL, Ben? He's still chatting there, so we'll chat there. Put the URL. Uh, let's see. We have a few more comments here, um, Alphonse. Uh, Okay, it has a good point in that the reason why it's so slow to insert data from access is because it's inserting one record at a time. Thanks, Alphonse, for the explanation. Uh, and then Klaus, a good friend Klaus here, is if having more data, I usually use PowerShell. Wow, I didn't know you could do that, especially using an Excel file and using a module for that imports. You know, I would just default to SSIS packages. I don't think there's called SSIS, by the way. I keep calling it that, but... But uh, I use, uh, I have never thought about that, Klaus. I'm going to probably uh, take you up on learning a little bit more about using PowerShell next to export into Excel files into SQL Server. And then regex101.com. Thank you so much, uh, Ben. So regex101.com. You guys need to 
explore that. We might bring Ben back later this year uh, before the break. And uh, our last our last chat is in May before the summer break. We might bring Ben back uh, to talk about the regex. Uh, he's a pretty humble kind of guy, so it takes a little arm twisting, but uh, I'm hoping we can bring him back and have him show his, the great work he's done there. He's been spent quite a few nights working on that project. So one of the things that uh, you know I just want to emphasize to everyone here is that is uh, this is not black magic. We know how to optimize access with SQL Server, and one of the biggest frustrations people have who are starting in this path is they think it's just a question of opening the data SQL Server and then using ODBC to link the tables, and everything is going to be hunky dory, and everything's going to be fine. Well, it's not. And the reason no, is absolutely that, not. Yeah, and you can see why. Philip was uh, makes a great case as to why that's not the case, right? I didn't know the why. I just know it doesn't work, I, but I know how to fix it. And so uh, I do that with uh, views to procedures, CTEs, to really optimize that connection between Access and SQL Server. And also, you know, sometimes you got to use your common sense. You know, I had, I had a, a great example of this where I worked on a project for a franchisee in the U.S., they have 35 franchises throughout the U.S., and they were using access. Each franchise has their own access database, and they would print out a report and send it to corporate office with their sales every month. And so they got tired of that. So, you know, we're going to bring these guys all online. And so we brought them all online, and uh, one of the demos I had was a search form. Well, I noticed during development that they were loading all the results for the customers, and then you can filter for the customer, and they were complaining how slow that was even on the local back end. And so when they went to SQL Server, I just didn't I just didn't show them any customers. You had to put in a last name or a street or a city. And uh, when they saw how fast that was, the president of the company turns to me and says, wow, wow, that was really quick. And it had nothing to do with pass-through queries or store procedures. It was just common sense where I don't preload the data into the form. Yes, absolutely. That makes a huge difference. If you use the kind of traditional beginner style of applications where you just slap on a, a form on top of a table without any uh, filters and stuff. And there are like 10,000 records in the table. Then, of course, stuff will be pretty slow and you will causing uh, uh, blocks on SQL Server due to the uh, interrupted read operations because if there are 10,000 records in a table and access just opens the, the form bound to the table, it will only read the first like 100 or 200 records. And then it says, oh, I, I'm not sure if I need that many records. And it just stops reading them. But the basic cursor that is used on SQL Server to fetch those records said, oh, well, my, my client stopped asking for more data. So I wait what's going on now. And the lock on the table might still be there. And that is causing huge problems because now you, you get to blocking between sessions. And of course, if you actually make access, fetch all those 10,000 records, it's really, really slow. And the user probably don't want to see 10,000 records in his form just to scroll to the end of it just for the sake of it. So, yeah, absolutely common sense. Query only the data you need. That is one of the very first um, kind of uh, uh, mantras I, I got when got getting into database development. And that is something that is still true today. If you don't need the data, then just exclude it by criteria right away and don't query it and, and just let it kind of go to waste on the client because you're wasting resources all over the place. Yep, yep. Now, you know, um, so, uh, you know, as an MVP, I had direct access to the team. And so I brought them up on the research you did here. And I said, come on, guys, we got to do better at this. You know, uh, now, to be fair with the access team, a lot of this stuff may not even fall in their, pur their, their purview. I don't even know and uh, if they're even responsible for the jet engine, per se. But I have to find that out. Uh, and so I think I suspect that this is a jet engine issue, and if they're not responsible for jet, then I'll probably have to find the guy who is at Microsoft and see if I can get him to do this, uh, do a better job of parsing the SQL statements. 
But a lot of times yeah. we're at the mercy as access developers uh, at different departments in access, at, at Microsoft. For example, the VBA editor that's used in Microsoft, there's a whole different group that does that. None of the teams such as Excel, Word, Access, have any say so in the VBA editor. So, uh, you know, that's been a source of frustration for me because that thing hasn't been approved since uh, for, for many years now. But yeah. One thing, but, one thing that, yeah. go ahead. You know, I, I just want to re remark if the Excel team says we need something in the VBA editor to kind of power a new Excel feature and it has to be there for the next version of Excel, I bet it will be there. But if the access team uh, asks for the same thing, they, the VBA team will say, yeah, maybe we'll think about it in 10 years. <laughs> yes, correct. Tom Wickraff, uh, it was is on a call. He says the access team owns a private jet. This is the performer. Thank you, Tom, for that. Now, uh, I came across an, a very interesting article of a new feature in Excel, and I'm going to paste it into the chat here. This is a blog post on how Excel is now using a new programming language uh, in their uh, product uh, for Turing. I don't know if you had a chance to look at this, Philippe, or not. Um, I haven't seen that. Um, and, and actually, I have to admit, I'm not really sure what the Turing complete stuff really yeah, means. Yeah, yeah. It but, pretty much means that you can define your own function in Excel uh, as a, and not have to do it in VBA is basically the gist of what I heard uh, yeah. from the uh, article. And so it's a good read. It just uh, shows you how the Excel guys have um, taken the product now to a different level. And, you know, um, we have a, another German who puts on the conferences every year. Uh, um, who's, the, who's the gentleman who does that? Um, it's Carl. Carl Donabach. Yes. Yeah, I know him very well. Yeah, and Carl has been a big champion of getting the Access team to use PowerShell, Power, not PowerShell, but Power uh, Power Query. Power, Power yeah. Query, yes. And I'm hearing some back channel chatter on, uh, on that. I can't uh, really be more specific, but I'm starting to hear that now uh, from the uh, back channel channel in Microsoft. So why am I, I'm crossing my fingers because that stuff is really potent. And, you know, I had this conversation with the team several years ago at the MVP conference, and they are all going to about leveraging Excel. So if they're not uh, they're not so much into, uh, if it wasn't invented here, they're not interested. They will definitely look that. Right now, I'll tell you, though, the team is 100% focused on trying to get the new Dataverse interface between Access and Dataverse. And we're going to, uh, we're going to actually be having uh, Evo, Ebo, excuse me, uh, who's the program manager for Microsoft Access next month in March. So I encourage all of you to uh, join us. So that's going to be an amazing chat with the person uh, and uh, who is directly responsible for what happens with the product, the product actually, the product manager. So uh, please come back and join us. We're not done here tonight, but just wanted to get that out there for you guys. But um, all right. Uh, and is it okay for us to open it up for questions, Philippe? Yes, absolutely. All right. So I have a question for Carl. Tell me, uh, can you unmute yourself, Carl? Tell me how you use PowerShell to import data into SQL Server. Can you explain a little bit more about that? If you mean Klaus, uh, then... Uh... Klaus. Yes, Klaus. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, it's late here, too. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, because Ka no, the problem is uh, Philip and, and, and me, uh, we are Germans. Karl is an Austrian, and that's a, okay. for, for us Germans, that's a big difference. Oh, sorry um, about that. No, no, I know that. That's only uh, I German just started Germany. another world that's, war between Germany and... Uh... <laughs> no, 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 it's just uh, internal. That, that's uh, Okay. Um, the, the Germans and the Austrians sometimes are not. Um, very green. To be um, fair, there's something similar between Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, right? You don't want <laughs> the Puerto Ricans to be called Mexicans, and the Mexicans don't want to be called Puerto Ricans. But Klaus, how do you use the uh, 
PowerShell. Tell us more about that. Oh, I have um, I have done uh, for for a, a customer. Uh, he wants on his server a version uh, to to write emails uh, and and individual emails to individual persons uh, with um, Rechnung fill with uh, yeah, invoices. Invoices. <clears throat> So what I did in access, in access was creating an, an an Excel sheet in in Access and dumping that to a file, and then I called uh, just an external uh, PowerShell uh, program that runs the 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 data and, and calls the data and and puts out the. Uh, the invoices okay and uh, creates the invoices and then and uh, then writes uh, the email that's all done yes. in, in powershell and it was well uh, i needed uh, some days because i'm not 200 fit in in percent fit in, in powershell as well so but but now it works and the, the good thing is that the customer doesn't need any um Excel or uh, something on his server, and no, uh, uh, nothing on this on the server itself to to do that because um, he doesn't want to have Outlook on his server. Interesting, interesting. I thought we you I thought in your particular case you were using PowerShell to import it to SQL Server. Uh, yeah, for that one I use uh, there is a special module. PowerShell is yeah is, is all full of modules. And there exists a module specially for Excel, and that uh, imports and exports uh, Excel files very uh, fast. Okay. Well, I definitely want to more having... details about how you're sending out emails without the Outlook because I use a uh, another pro saw together which I can't remember right now, but uh, that's interesting. So thank you so much, Klaus. All right. Um, any other I questions? Get, um, I, I can do some some. Uh, uh, writing in in that. Thank you, thank or you very some, much. I appreciate that. All but right. Uh, generally, uh, PowerShell is much easier than SSIS. And additionally, if you, for example, have a customer only having the the express version of uh, of SQL Server, then he doesn't have uh, SSIS officially. Correct. And a lot of our customers who use Express. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And 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 partial uh, he can download if he doesn't have it. It's leaked. All right. Okay. So far thank, from thank me. you so much for the for the for the clarification. All right. Any other? I, questions? I have another question. Yes, I sir. Use, uh, just opposite to to you and Phil, I sometimes use um, the uh, the SSMS to uh, use the queries in and and. To do the queries in SQL Server directly, uh, because I had one customer who had the written the queries itself, and they have been the most horrible queries I have seen ever. It has been seventeen queries, uh, query within query. And and what I did because I was too lazy to to translate all that, I put uh, the. Uh, all the queries in in, in uh, with SSMS in in SQL Server, and put uh, just uh, the result back. And that will work quite well. So I think that's a. Possible so let way. me just clear that up. You had the process and access that was using a lot of queries, right? And yes, we call that daisy chaining queries, where you say, okay, yeah. query one is using query two, query two is using query yeah. three, yeah. and he has seventeen of those. Yes, and the Horrible. last one is it, bound to the last one is just bound to the report. And so what you did is you went into yeah. SQL Server and you created seventeen views. I mixed them uh, so that yeah, okay, and, and, and I combined them, and it was right. it was uh, fast enough. So and so that's one of the things that a typical access developer will do when they start exploring with SQL Server, right? They create these daisy chains and views because you know honestly that's all we know that's all we do it that's how we do in access so we do it in sql server but you don't really need to do that with sql I, server instead i encourage you guys i know to use, that 
I okay, would good. never have done it. Uh, so, but it was ready queries, and I had I didn't have too much money or didn't get too much money, so I didn't want to to uh, elaborate uh, uh, all that yeah. seventeen yeah. queries. So the uh, way I would do that was with CTEs. Is that what you would have done as well? Mm. What do you mean? No, not yes. not very much. So there's a there's a there is a methodology in SQL Server that allows you to nest queries. It's called common table expressions, CTE. So no, no, I'm, I mean, you, if I'm going to if if using more difficult queries, I'm I use I use always uh, directly the the, uh, the okay. procedures. So, so do you have a question I, for us on that? Uh, I know you. No, no, it just was a point. Yeah, the question is why okay. uh, why don't you use it? I had quite good experience with the the uh, compilation of the queries in in Excel, but only in the last three or four versions of S S S M S. Before that, it was horrible, but but now they uh, they went much better. Yeah. So a typical Access developer will use the query builder uh, feature in SSMS because that's what they know, right? In Access, they bring up yeah. the query builder and the drive tables and draw the links. I, I know uh, that's I've, horrible. I've, yes. noticed, uh, I've noticed that over the years, I just, uh, the more simpler queries, I just type it into SMS, select star <laughs> from this, and uh, they join that. In. And that's easier for me now that I've got the syntax for T-SQL ingrained in my, in my, in my blood. But... Uh, yeah, you know, there is a query builder in SQL Server Management Studio that's gotten better, but still... Yeah, uh, don't, don't use that one. I, I just uh, use the, the SSMS, the, the query itself. I put that yes. as a view in uh, yeah. translated all that as a view and combined yes. the views, that 17 views within SQL Server. So yes. that the result uh, is, is done in SQL Server, so that was fast enough. Okay. I just wanted to good. mention because I didn't have the time. I didn't get paid uh, all the days to to explore all the seventeen queries. You know, and Got because it. I, Got I would it. have needed uh, two or three days for that because each table has uh, they have also a very spread table to uh, 150, 200 fields each and bad namings. Additional yeah, words, Klaus, words. Um, if, I, if I can pick up there, um, absolutely. I, I do not uh, tell people not to do that. Um, absolutely. If you want to do uh, query development on SQL Server, absolutely do it. Um, that is actually one of the best solutions to create a view or if you if you can uh, a stored procedure and put stuff on sql server i wouldn't stack like 17 uh, views on top of each other. that is a bit of uh, uh, overkill but uh, absolutely do that that is probably the best way to to get to a good performance if you have some basic queries that are used multiple times, create those as views on SQL Server. That is absolutely the best approach. I just wanted to highlight the problem with just working on, on client-side queries. I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, so um, I never would have uh, programmed that program uh, as it was, but you know, how yeah. you uh, uh, Klaus. Sorry if I interrupt, but maybe uh, there are other people that also want to ask some questions. Yes, yeah, let's okay. do that. Let's do that. Thank you, Klaus. All right. Anybody else? Um, anybody else uh, has any questions, comments, observation for our special guest, Philippe, or anything in general for Microsoft Access with guys or SQL Server? Going once. Going twice. All right. Well, look, this has been Juan Soto with Access with SQL Server. Uh, I thank you once again to my special guest, Philippe, for joining us at uh, now at 2 in the morning in, in Germany. I appreciate yeah, that. You're a real trooper. Actually, and, uh, almost a quarter to three. <laughs> almost a quarter to three. And, uh, you know, we got to talk because uh, if you want to be an MVP again, I'd love to help you with that journey. You know, now another MVP has to nominate you. So let's have that discussion off, off, off after record. Uh, the, if you still want to be an MVP, I'd love to be able to nominate you. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please uh, join us again next month, uh, second Tuesday of the month, we're here, where we're going to have to actually have the uh, 
uh, Ebo, Ebo from uh, Microsoft as our special guest. And I'm, I'm predicting, no, don't, don't hold me to this, but I'm predicting he's going to make some news. I'm hoping he brings some news uh, that's going to uh, be interesting. So looking forward to that. And also we have some other sessions throughout the month. We got uh, Microsoft Access CET, which is uh, earlier in the morning, which is great for people, our friends in Germany, because that's at 9 30 in the morning. Uh, and we have Access Lunchtime, which is at noon, which is even which is not as good as 9 30, but at least it's it's not 6 30 p.m. like mine's are. And uh, we have some special announcements here coming up soon. And in March, I'm hoping that we um, that we'll have some news regarding a new access user group that's launching in March. So we're looking forward to that. So pay attention. We're looking forward to not making that announcement. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. Very much, everyone. Again, join me tomorrow. More tomorrow, if your Spanish is good, half as good as mine is, and where I have SQL Server with Access Academy for Access Latin America. So long, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you very much for attending, everybody. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye-bye.